Gracious God, we give you thanks for this morning. And as we are gathered here, God, we ask that you would open us up, that you would open up our eyes to see and open up our ears to hear. God, we pray that you would open up our hearts to receive the gift of your presence. And then, Lord, that you would open up our hands to share the good news and to be in service with all your people. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, we've just started to receive Christmas cards at our house this past week, as I'm sure many of you have. Um, there's a spirally snowman-shaped card holder hanging on our wall that will be full of them by the end of the month. And all of these cards, with, with a few exceptions, they're going to be the same. They're going to have as the centerpiece a picture of a family, of a, a couple or parents and their kids and maybe some grandparents, maybe pets, and all of them will be smiling ear to ear, as if it is the most natural, everyday thing in the world for families to dress in matching plaid shirts and to be throwing piles of leaves up into the air together, right? That's something that all of us do every single day with our families, right? If that's your family Christmas card, I'm excited to, to get it. I can't wait to see it. And, and I'm not making fun of that. I'm just, I'm passive-aggressively expressing my jealousy that those kind of shots happen because they don't happen in my family. Um, but then uh, around, around all of these pictures, all of these families, um, many of them will have somewhere on the border in, in red or green or blue font the word peace. And I, I have come to appreciate these cards more and more each year because I know the secret. I know that they are a lie. <laughs> I know that right before that picture of peace, someone was shouting, stop it, sit still, get your hands off of her, don't touch him, leave him alone, just smile, we're almost done. <laughs> right? I have learned through my own family experience just how much begging and pleading and arm twisting and reward promising and punishment threatening goes into making that one perfect peaceful snapshot possible but that's exactly what it is right it's a snapshot it is a a moment captured uh, a moment of peace and harmony that anyone who's ever been a part of such photo shoots knows is so fleeting <laughs> and is is so often filled on either side with a lot of unpeace, right? For many of us, when we talk about peace in our families, or when we talk about peace in our lives, what we're really talking about is that brief period where nobody is throwing a shoe at someone, right? Uh, for many of us, what we define as peace is probably better described as just a ceasefire. It is it is a, a short period of time where everyone has agreed to just play nicely and quietly, or at least to sit still long enough so that we can get the picture taken. The other thing that I notice about the way that we experience peace often, especially this time of year, in addition to its brevity, is that it often has to do with some sort of separation from everything. We talk about needing to get away from it all and, and needing to have just some time, some alone time, in order to experience peace. I've noticed this about myself, that when I am in a period of my life where I feel like I need more peace, I start to offer uh, to go do the grocery shopping. Okay, my wife thinks that I'm trying to be helpful, but really I'm just trying to get some alone time. I just, I just want 45 minutes by myself. Anybody else guilty of doing this? I don't, I don't, I don't wanna give you away, but I think my wife has figured out what I'm doing, but she lets me do it anyways. But that's, that's kind of our strategy for peace for a lot of us, you know? It's, it's separating ourselves. It's getting away. It's separating ourselves from whatever group of people or, or conflict or situation uh, that we believe is responsible for our lack of peace. And so peace becomes a trip somewhere else. Peace becomes sending the kids to their rooms. Peace becomes a good set of headphones. That's what peace becomes in our lives. But like, like a ceasefire, this is not what the Bible means when it talks about peace either. That's, that's vacation, okay? That's hiding. 
That's escape. In the second half of our reading this morning, when Isaiah starts to talk about all of the animals living together, he gives us a radical picture of peace to consider. And what what I note, first of all, is that it's not a temporary peace. It's not like the lion sits next to the calf politely in time for the picture and then devours it once the camera is put away. Okay? This is a more lasting peace. It's a lasting peace where where the calf no longer lives in fear for its life, no longer lives in vulnerability, and the lion no longer lives with the desire to kill and to conquer and to destroy. Both the calf and the lion, all the animals have a nature that is transformed. Something new happens in them to create that peace. And neither is this a peace of separation. Right? Isaiah doesn't say that God's peace will finally be achieved when the bears just stay with the bears and the leopards with the leopards and the lambs stay over here with the lambs, right? That's that's how we make zoos a nice place to visit. We use walls and dividers and fences and barricades so that these animals over here don't have to mix with the animals over there that they really would rather not mix with. But Isaiah is not imagining a zoo. Isaiah is, is imagining a new creation, or better yet, a recreation of what God intended in the garden way back in the beginning, a time when all of God's creatures live together in peace and harmony. It's that, that last, those last verses have come to be called the peaceable kingdom. Maybe you've seen some, some art about the peaceable kingdom, and it's a beautiful image, isn't it? Lions and lambs playing together, kids and snakes wrestling, cows and bears walking hoof and paw with one another. And I know some of you are thinking, look, I don't really care if lions and lambs ever live together. I would just love if my kids could make it from the house to the church without fighting one time. I would love to just be able to coexist with my spouse or my parents or my siblings or my coworkers for more than a week without feeling the need to strangle one of them. And maybe that's why Isaiah gives us such an exaggerated, extraordinary picture of peace. So that we might come to believe that if If God says that that kind of peace is one day possible, maybe we would start to believe that the peace that we really desire, peace with God, peace with our neighbors, peace within ourselves, maybe that, maybe that's actually possible too. And this is where the first part of the reading is really important. Because remember that the reading begins not with the picture of peace. The reading begins with the promise of God's spirit. Let me read it again for you. It talks about the shoot, right, rising up from the stump of Jesse. And then it says that the Lord's spirit will rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom, understanding, planning, strength, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. He won't judge by appearances, but with righteousness. And he won't decide by hearsay, but with justice for all of those who suffer. Now, what does all that mean? Well, what it means is that peace is not something that we just stumble upon by chance from time to time. What it means is that peace is not something that we have to go somewhere else to find. What it means is that peace is something that can be made right here. That peace is something that can be made everywhere and anywhere that God's presence, God's spirit is at work within us. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus said. Now, if he had said, blessed are the conflict avoiders, I would have a life full of blessing. And maybe you would too. I have, I have lived my whole life carefully refining that skill of conflict avoidance. But Jesus doesn't say, blessed are the conflict avoiders. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Conflict avoidance That's not the way to peace. The scripture says that the only way to reach peace, the only way to get to the peaceable kingdom is to make it. 
to make it among us, to make it with the power of God's Spirit. What would that look like in your life? What would that look like in the life of this church? What would that shoot coming up out of the stump look like if God's Spirit were to come and descend upon it? Think about some of the ways that Jesus made peace in his life, right? One day, Jesus and the disciples, they were just out going about their ministry, and people started to bring children to Jesus. And children then were like children now. They were loud and messy. And they always had like stuff dripping from their noses. Those, that's, that's who was coming to Jesus. And the disciples said, wait a minute. This is, this is destroying the peace of our fellowship together. And Jesus said, no, it's not. Jesus said, let the children come. Because the kingdom of God, the peaceable kingdom, belongs to them as much as it does to you and to anyone else. What, if, what, if, what would that look like in this church? You know, if this, if this were a place where we believed that the church really did belong to children as much as it belongs to the adults who are paying the pledges. I mean, what would it look like if this were a church that celebrated the noise and the energy of children in worship and at Wednesday night supper and every other place? What if we really believed what Jesus said, that peace doesn't come from keeping out? Peace comes from welcoming in and living together with those things that you think are disruptive. Peace comes by welcoming that into your midst. Look at Jesus' closest friends. Among them was Simon the Zealot, whose politics were centered on violent opposition to Rome and its government, and Matthew the tax collector, who lived a life of welcome accommodation of the Romans, and ten other guys whose political beliefs were everywhere in between. Does your circle of friends look like that? Does your circle of friends have conservatives and liberals? Democrats and Republicans? Maybe, maybe the reason that, that we don't find peace with people of one group or another is because we have completely separated ourselves from them. And so who are the people in our lives that, that we could welcome in and that we could seek to make the greater peace of friendship and understanding with rather than settling for the lesser peace of tolerance or avoidance. Perhaps the way that, that all of us can make a little more peace this year is through the practice of forgiveness. Because how often are our interactions with certain people, how often do they look more and more like that Christmas snapshot of peace where whenever we're together with them, we hold the smile just long enough for the picture to be taken but beforehand and afterwards, our words and our actions and our spirits are anything but peaceful towards them. Maybe one of the ways that we can enjoy more peace this Christmas is to ask for and to offer forgiveness. Today we come to a table where that's possible. Today we come to a table that's all about forgiveness. Today we come to a table where we can begin to make that peace that, that Isaiah spoke of, where he said that peace begins, right? Peace begins when the Spirit of the Lord descends upon us. And in a minute, we're going to pray that the Holy Spirit would be poured out upon these gifts of bread and juice and that the Holy Spirit would be poured into our hearts so that we might be one with each other, so that we all of us might be reconciled in peace with God and with our neighbor. And today we're coming to a table that, that invites everyone, left and right, black and white, old and young, lions and lambs, all eating together, the peaceable kingdom, right here in a fellowship hall. That's where it starts. And so if you're here this morning and you feel like you are in need of more peace in your life, which I, I think is probably every one of us, then I hope that you will come to this table and receive the Holy Spirit, receive that spirit that, 
will enable us with wisdom and understanding and strength to make that peace that we so desire to have. Not by separating ourselves into our like groups, but by coming together. Not by enjoying a peace that lasts just for a snapshot, just for a moment, but by creating a peace that God says lasts forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. God, during this time of year when we're so busy, when we're caught up in all of the things that need to be done, when we have our checklists, for many of us, peace seems to always find its way to the bottom of that checklist. And it's something that we always feel like is just unreachable until we've done all the things that we need to do. Pray, Lord, that through the guidance of your spirit, we might make peace a priority not just this season, but in our lives every day. That we might receive the power of your Holy Spirit to make that peace. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of your Son that we celebrate this season, the Prince of Peace, who has come to show us how that's possible. And we pray all of this in his name. Amen. I want to invite those who are um, serving and for our musicians to come forward for communion. When we come to this table, we come remembering the night that Jesus gave himself up for us, how he sat among the disciples, among that group of people with whom he had made peace, and he took the bread from the center of the table, and after he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples, and he said, take and eat. This is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks for it, he gave it to the disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant that is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray together. Almighty God, we give you thanks for these mighty acts through your son, Jesus. And we pray this morning that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon the gifts of bread and juice, that you would make them be the body and the blood of Christ so that we might be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. God, we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon all of us and into each of our hearts, making us one with Christ, making us one in peace with each other, making us one in ministry to the entire world until that day when Christ comes again in final victory, and we feast together at his heavenly banquet. God, we pray all of this through the name of your Son, Jesus, with the Holy Spirit in this your holy church, where all honor and glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.